Morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Very well. Uh, as Pastor Honor already mentioned, um, my name is Kenny, and I have the lovely privilege uh, of um, serving uh, these lovely people. Um, I have the lovely privilege of sometimes even coming up here like this and um, expressing God's word. And uh, what an amazing privilege it is. Um, I serve with uh, three other elders and their families. And once again, uh, if I have not greeted you, if I have not said hello, I'd like to meet you after, man. But this is just me and extending a, a welcome if you're visiting. Uh, man, I pray that today is a remarkable day for you. And so, as, as has been discussed, today I have the privilege of sharing God's word with us. And so, our message for this morning, um, uh, it's coming from, from Matthew. It's quite a popular story. It's a, uh, it's a story that uh, I think most, uh, whether you churched or unchurched, you, you probably heard this story. And this is a story about a man that approaches Jesus, um, and he's asking him uh, a very, very big question about life, all right? It's a life-changing question. And so if you turn to the to this story in the Bible, uh, often uh, there might be a heading there that says the rich young ruler. And I'm going to cheat a bit today, uh, and I think I'm allowed to, but I'm going to title it the poor rich young ruler. And if you're about to say, is rooted changing the Bible? No, I'm absolutely not changing the Bible, right? This is just a heading, right? Some Bibles just go bang on raw. That's just the scriptures. There's no headings and some have headings. And so permit me to then go with this title of the poor rich young ruler. Now, you might be wondering, uh, how can one be both poor and rich? How is it possible? Uh, to that I say it is very possible, right? And all of this is dependent on uh, what metric you're using. So metric, um, base, basically a basis of measurement, a unit of measurement, not to be confused with matrix or matrix. <laughs> yeah, it's like, this is, God gave us English, let's work with it, you know? And so, great example, right, of this where themes, things seem to be contradictory, but this is based on what metric you're using. If we look at our lovely continent, Africa, right, from a, a different perspective, many might say that this is a very poor continent, right? Africa has been dubbed the dark continent because economically uh, we have no power. Things happen to our continent. We don't influence anything, right? And so economically, we have no muscle. But if you use a different metric, right, if we, if, we, if we look at our continent as it is, what it presents in terms of raw material, man, that narrative changes very quickly. Yeah. Africa is a very wealthy continent, right? If, you, if Africa was to almost just disappear or cease to exist, or if we stopped exporting raw material, Whole industries, whole countries would come to a standstill. Right. And so, with this, I wouldn't even go in terms of, I wouldn't even go into the richness of, the, of our culture and our diversity, uh, just who we are. If you just go to the next uh, country, just how different it is and what it presents. And so with that, we have to be very careful in terms of which metric we are choosing. So this is even more in our lives, you know? What metric are we using for success, for joy, for happiness? Because this will determine our path in life, this will determine our trajectory, this will determine what we expand our energy on, this will, this will determine how we're going to approach life. In the same breath, this will also determine the things that will be lacking in our lives, the things that we say, this very thing I will not put that much emphasis on. And so, just a brief background on our text for this morning. 
so the story of the rich young ruler, it's actually in, in three places. It's called uh, the, the Synoptic Gospels. And uh, the Synoptic Gospel basically is that these, um, these Gospels run parallel to one another. The stories are very similar. Um, even the sequence and events of how everything is captured is very similar. So uh, from time to time, you will find me, uh, although we'll be anchored in Matthew, you will find me taking some details from the other Gospels. And so when we look at this uh, encounter that Jesus has uh, with this man, uh, this man asked, two, asked several questions. Uh, two of these questions, very big questions. These are very, very big questions. These are questions that uh, throughout civilization, people have asked these questions. These are questions that um, people have, have they've tried to answer these questions according to their context, according to how they view life. These are questions that, depending on the answer that we get, it will determine our trajectory, as, as I already mentioned. Also determine our future generations, how they live. And these two questions are... Uh, what good do I need to do uh, to get eternal life? And then the second question is, what do I lack? But before I get ahead of myself, um, let's read the text for this morning. Uh, and if you will, can you please stand as we read the text? It's from Matthew 19, uh, verses 16 uh, to 22. Uh, it's going to go up on the back there, but uh, you're more than welcome to follow me uh, on your device. And so, this is how the word of the Lord reads. Just then, someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He asked him. Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your mother and your father um, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I've kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. In verse 22, when the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Let's pray. Lord, such a weighty, a weighty text, but... Uh, you don't leave us alone to, to wrestle through um, these kind of things, Lord. And so, Lord Jesus, um, our prayer this morning, our request, our plea, is that you hear the cry within, Lord, that we are in desperate need of you, Lord, uh, that you are the one true treasure, Lord. You are, the, you are the one that is in the center of it all, Lord. You are the one that completes everything, Lord, that anything outside of you, Lord, it's barren, it's death. And so, Lord, um, as I share this word, uh, my words are empty without you. They have absolutely no power. They will not move anything. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, speak through me. May I be your instrument. Uh, but I pray that your word goes out to uh, hearts that are ready to hear from the Holy One. And I pray, Lord, that there is a transformation that happens. I pray, Lord, that whatever comes from here, from the top here, Lord, I pray that it's an invitation, an invitation to um, not even just a better life, but the greatest life that one could ever live, Lord. And so, Lord move with us whatever it is that we are carrying, whether it's positive, whether it's negative, whatever it is that we brought you, Lord. I pray that you may deal with it and deal with it decisively, Lord, and free us from it. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, our text sets the scene with a man approaching Jesus. 
So Mark's account gives a little bit more, more detail. So Matthew just tells us, this man approached Jesus, but Matthew just, he adds a little bit of detail here and there. He says, this man not only approached Jesus, but this man ran up to Jesus and he knelt before Jesus. And so what I, what I would say from that observation is that whatever this man was bringing to the table, it was weighty. It was something of importance. And even added to that, when he comes, uh, let's, read, let's actually read the text. It says, um, just then someone came up and asked him, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? This, this word teacher uh, translated from the word rabbi or master. And so this word, uh, this title of rabbi, right, it actually wasn't that common, right? This, this was something that people sought after. In Jewish tradition, what would happen is that in a very patriotic, patriotic, patriarchic society, the father, when, when, people, when the father walks into a room, everyone would stand. And the only instance where this was different was if the son was a rabbi, and then the father would also stand for the son. And so what's happening here is that this man is approaching Jesus loss of respect and I'm trying to paint a picture here is that there was a sense of genuineness right there was a sense of sincerity and there was a sense of humility as he approaches Jesus this is very important because uh, Jesus had many encounters right Jesus had many encounters with uh, religious leaders and a lot of the time some of them were very insidious a lot of them were they're trying to catch Jesus out and I'm quite convinced that this was not one of those moments. So this man here was actually genuine in his approach to Jesus. And so, as we continue, we get the first of the big questions. What good must I do to have eternal life? And let's see how Jesus responds in verse 17. So Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And so I, I, in typical Jesus uh, uh, fashion, he doesn't, he answers a question with a question, right? Which I imagine was very, very frustrating. I, I imagine like, I can imagine the disciples would, would go out like, hey Jesus, there's a special in the corner, like uh, loaves of bread and fish. What type of fish do you want? And Jesus responds, is a fish really a fish if, it, if it's outside of water? And, and it's like, it's very frustrating. But I do believe that Jesus Christ being uh, the God man, Jesus Christ being the all knowing, uh, Jesus Christ knowing our hearts, uh, knew that sometimes the most important thing isn't the answer. Sometimes the important thing is the journey to the answer, right? Hear me out. Sometimes the most important thing isn't just the answer itself, but it's us working and wrestling through that. And this is something that I've learned recently. So what we often do is we... We approach, we approach God and we've got a, a question, we've got a request, uh, we need a, an immediate response. And then this is great. We often, we, sometimes we get the response, we get the, um, the answer to prayer and that's, that's all great. But I think sometimes we miss the bigger point. And the bigger point is that whatever happens before uh, the process of actually getting the response is just as important. And as much as I love hearing the story, I love uh, people coming up here and said, hey, we've been praying for this and God answered the prayer. Uh, man, I want to hear the stories where people haven't gotten their responses yet yeah. and people are wrestling and waiting. Yeah. I believe that there's, in as much as there is transformation um, in getting your, your prayer answered, man, that is powerful. But man, there's as much transformation in that process of wrestling and waiting, that anticipation of waiting for God to work. 
And so I know that this is, this is very tough. It's very tough to, to wrestle, uh, to wait on God, especially if the answer at the end is a no, right? No one likes that. And, I, and one of the things that I, I think that I, I dislike is, we know, we've created whole theologies around this in an attempt to kind of like block out that whole thing of waiting on God and getting the answer that we don't want. You know, it's that whole thing of, you know, if one door closes here, God will open another door, right? That is no way in the Bible, guys, yeah. right? Yeah. That is absolutely no way in the Bible. All right, there will be times where God closes all the doors, all right? And there will be times where God opens all the doors, right? But here's the thing, when God closes all the doors, right? And you're there, you're waiting, you're wrestling. You're saying, God, when, right? The stories of people that are trying to conceive, the stories of the people that are looking for that job because they really need it, not because they're trying to actually get onto the next big position, yeah. right? God closes those doors, but in that moment, while you're waiting, while you're wrestling, while there's anticipation, in that moment, God is there with you. Do not waste that time of waiting. Do not waste that time of wrestling. There is transformation right there. And so, I believe Jesus recognized that for this man, the journey to getting to the answer was just as important. And so, Jesus then responds, says, why do you ask what is good? Only one is good. So what Jesus is doing here, uh, he's establishing that there is only one objective metric of what is good, and that is God. He is the standard of moral uprightness. Meaning that if he is the standard, we need to abide by the standards that he has set. And so those standards are captured in the essence of the commandments. If you want to see God's character, what he's, the, what he's about, we just need to read through the commandments. And what this does is, once, once, we, have, once we have a standard of what is good, right, for this, for this man, it establishes the basis, right? There, is, there, isn't, there isn't, this is my version of good, uh, there's in, there isn't a comparison. And for us as well, we don't get into a room and get to actually decide what is good, what is not good. Right? God gets to decide that. So if you want to be good, you keep the standards. And so verse 18, let's see how the man responds. So the man responds and he says, which ones, right? And so, <laughs> almost there's a hint of cherry picking already. Like, which ones? You know? But in his defense, you know, uh, there were about 613 laws. So I'd play devil's advocate and say, uh, maybe for him, he's trying to figure out which one, because 613 laws... Some were very contextual, some were for a specific things, some were for rituals, some were for a specific season, right? So I can kind of, you know, defend him and say that, fair enough, you can ask which ones, but I think on the other side of the spectrum, I think there's an indication of that he kept some and didn't keep some others, right? And we are aware of this. This is the whole... I'm going to keep the laws that I like. I'm going to keep the ones that are convenient to the particular season that I'm in. But isn't this like us? We cherry pick what things we want to observe. It's almost, you could call, call it a form of convenient obedience, all right? Convenient obedience, which in, in truth, it's just disobedience. And so here's the thing about convenient obedience. It allows us to elevate ourselves above those that may be struggling in those specific areas that we are not struggling in. It's a self-serving type of righteousness. 
And so just, just for a minute, right, just a test, something that you, can, you guys can talk about after the service, right? I want you to guys, guys to go back to this last week. Guys are very busy people and all that stuff, but when you had an opportunity to, to talk to other people, whatever, or you were just thinking about stuff, right? Just want you to think back, right? When you guys were talking about, let's say, other people, right? And they were the subject, because I know that, man, we love people, so we want to we talk about them because we want to pray for them, <laughs> you know? So, so that's it's a safe place. <laughs> did, did, was, when we're talking about these people, was, was the subject um, people that, you know what, this person is killing it in a specific area, you know, this person is basically being obedient and uh, chasing after the Lord in an area that I happen to not be good at, in an area that I'm struggling with. So much so that I found some conviction of sin, like, man, that person, you know, uh, Philip, man, they're pursuing God so hard, it's convicting me. Like, man, I don't even want to go to church because when I see them, I get convicted. Was our conversation like that? Or was it, let me find uh, Mary, and I'm just popping out names, so if this is any of you, I'm sorry. Mary and Bob, who, man, they are the worst. They are the worst. They are not being obedient. They are compromising. They are the type of people that, man, we need to pray for these people because each and every day, man, it's something new. And they happen uh, to be sucking in the area that we are not struggling with, right? And so what tends to happen is that we, we elevate the areas that we go in. We elevate the areas that, you know what, I'm killing it in this area, and yet the other areas that we're not so good at, we're very, very silent on. And here's the thing. As much as this could be just this is just my issue. This is in my own personal space. My disobedience isn't doing anything to anyone. This is dangerous, guys, because what people do is we find people who think exactly like us, who do exactly the same things as we do, who believe in the things that we do. Soon enough, we build a community on convenient, or diso- uh, convenient obedience. Soon enough, we start churches, all right? Guys, we just have to look at our country. We just look at, have to look at South Africa. Like just 50, 60 years back, the apartheid church, the idea that there is apartheid and church together, does, that doesn't make sense. People would wake up every Sunday to go to a church that was segregated, right? This was their convenient obedience, that we are going to take certain laws, we're going to be obedient to them, we will tithe in this church, we will serve every Sunday, but these groups of people, no, they're not allowed in here. And so when we get to pick and choose the things that we want to obey, man, we're on a dangerous path. And so for me, when this man says, which ones, my inclination is if I'm Jesus, I'm just like, let's just cut this conversation short. If you've broken a part of the law, you've broken the whole law. Yeah. Uh, but Jesus has time. <laughs> Jesus has time, and that is great news because if Jesus has time for him, Jesus has time for us. Yeah. So the rest of, of uh, verse 18 gives us Jesus' response. So Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so what Jesus is doing, he, he zooms in on the second table of the commandments, right? And so these commandments, these are the commandments that deal with um, our interactions as people, as made in the image of God. This is our daily engagements. And, and he focuses on that, which is super genius, guys. Like, this is super genius. Like, I was reading through this, like, man, Jesus is, like, on another level. But we'll, we'll find out later why. 
So the second half, like as I stated, the second half of the commandments deal mainly with human engagements, our relationship, right? The first, the first half, um, most of you would you'd know this, right? Uh, whether or not you grew up in the church, this is the, you shall not have other gods before me, you shall not make idols, do not misuse the name of the Lord and keep the Sabbath holy, right? So Jesus doesn't take those, he takes the second half. Everything is important, right? But he takes the second half and there's a reason. Now, he says, have you kept these, right? And yeah, my man, boldly, boldly, is like, I have kept all of these. <laughs> like, man, I like, very bold, I have kept all of these. And in, in other accounts, um, I'm not sure, I think it's Mark's account, um, he says, I've kept them since my youth, yeah. right? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I mean, this, uh, this, this guy should have been Paul, right? <laughs> So, so yeah, as we move on, he follows that bold statement with the big question, what do I still lack, right? And so from here, we kind of start to pick a pattern of his character, his approach to life. And so what we see is someone who really backed themselves, right? What we see is someone who's gone through life He's done things, he's done them by his own strength. Yeah. And therefore, if there's anything that he's lacking, uh, he can make up for it, yeah. right? Sure. So we don't have a lot of information uh, of who this man was, but if we're to piece together uh, a generic profile on him from the three gospels, uh, we know that he was Jewish, right? Because no Roman person is approaching Jesus and asking life questions, right? He was very religious, already established that. I have followed all the commandments. Um, I think Luke tells us he was a ruler. And so this ruler, this title ruler, uh, would have been used for people who, uh, who had administrative power. So he was probably in the local synagogue of the Sanhedrin. And Matthew tells us that he was young. And then all three accounts tell us that he was extremely wealthy. So in summary, uh, this man was extremely wealthy. Uh, this man had administrative muscle. He could make things happen. Right, this man had an amazing social profile and he had age on his side. This is, uh, this is the type of man that everyone aspires to be. And yet, with all his influence, with his wealth, with his power, he stands before Jesus and he says, what do I still lack? Sure. Sure. So this man realizes that surely something is still missing. Yeah. But his default is that maybe there's still something that he can do. Yeah. 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 So he still thinks that if there's a missing gap. Maybe there's something that I can do about that missing gap. And he thinks that that missing gap in his life is something that he can just plug with his thumb. And not realizing that that gap in his life is a massive black hole. And that black hole sucks everything in life. That no matter what you throw at it, you will be throwing everything at it for the rest of your life, thinking that you'll be able to plug it. And nothing nothing will work and it will tie you and it will take you to the end. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing that can deal with this black hole, it's a cosmic being mm. with a cosmic love. And so it's a being that does a cosmic act that will never be repeated. And this is what he's missing. This is what is missing. And we, we see this, we see this every day. We just have to open social media in the, couple, in the last couple of weeks, there's a story that uh, came about. It's the story of a guy called 
Marcus Pearson, right? I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him, but he's the creator of a, go of a game called Minecraft, right? Um, this is very, it's very weird, the things that we put emphasis on in life, but um, for his particular industry, for gaming, for being a developer, this man had arrived, yeah. right? So this man sells this game, guys. He sells this game for, I think, 2.9 billion dollars, 2.9 billion dollars. In rands, that's about just over 40 uh, billion rands. That, that is, it's a different story as to why, but yeah, but so this, this man has, has achieved what most of us would want in life. He's got wealth, he's got recognition, um, yet, his life starts to fall apart. He gets married. His marriage doesn't go beyond a year. And then he, he tweets one of the saddest things ever. And it speaks to the culture. And basically in the tweet, he says that, I'm in Ibiza with parting with famous people. Uh, I can have whatever I, whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. But I've never felt this isolated in my life. And so, before we think that this is a, a Marcus person issue, it isn't. This is also our issue. We find ourselves in the same boat with the things that we're pursuing, the things that we're going after, you know, the next position, right? And after that position, it's not enough. And then the next position, you reach the pinnacle and you realize that there's absolutely nothing, right? We're continuously pouring ourselves into our careers, our families, whatever it is, fill in the blanks. We promise us so much, and we think that when once we get that particular thing, we will feel complete. And that is not the truth. And so what do I still lack? Let's have a look at how Jesus responds. So Jesus says, if you want to be perfect... Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. And so once again, Jesus, Jesus could have given the simple answer. He could have said, you lack a lot. But this isn't what Jesus says. So Jesus says, go sell your belongings, give to the poor. And I believe in this, there's, there's, there's two lessons, right? There's two lessons. The, the first lesson, it's a very, very obvious lesson, right? Um, even in the, if, you, if you read further on, Jesus unpacks this, right? Uh, and the simplest one, if you read the rest of the text, is that Jesus goes on further to say that, you know, how hard it is for the rich, for the rich uh, to inherit the kingdom of God. And this is because the easy thing, uh, we are churched, uh, we know this. Uh, riches give us a false sense of security and assurance. And so all it takes is just one day, one phone call, and everything is wiped away. And, it even, and if it isn't wiped away, uh, you will spend the rest of your life feeling like you're empty. I just told you the story of Marcus Pearson. How many of us would want to be in this position? How many of us would just want a fraction of what we have because we think our lives will be better? But the rest of the world is screaming. That's not where life is. That's not where life is. And they're singing this gospel, and they're the world, and they see it. Man, how much more for us in the community here? All right? So now, in terms of this man, we don't, we don't really know if, you know, he walked away, he changed, if he changed his life. Uh, I'm hoping he did, but if he didn't, uh, sadly, about 30 years, 30 plus years later on, um, Jerusalem was laid siege to. So everything he'd ever worked for, whether or not he was still alive, whether or not he passed it on to his children, it was all wiped away just like that. 
how much more if we if we pass on to our children if we disciple them into a living treasure into a treasure that will never be taken away from them how much more that no amount of calamity no 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 economic economic hassles nothing in this world could take it away from them And so the second lesson, the second lesson, this one tested the veracity of his claims. So he claims, I have obeyed all of these. So he says, do not murder, do not steal, do not um, commit adultery. I have kept all of these. If you remember, I said, you know, Jesus mentioning this was super genius. And this is why. If you, if you claim that the commandments that deal with uh, human interactions, um, the sanctity of life, if you claim that you have obeyed those commandments and you've obeyed them fully, surely the idea of giving away your possessions to the poor would not be a hard thing. And this is the journey that Jesus is walking him through. Right, that if you claim you love your neighbor as yourself, thank you, <laughs> then the idea of giving, it, giving everything you have to people that don't have, it's not a big ask. And so our relationships, our interactions with one another, they're in some way a reflection of our relationship and our communion or lack thereof with God. And if we are consistently breaking the first half of the Ten Commandments where we have to make God central, uh, rest assured that we are breaking the rest. In some shape or form, we are all dishonoring one another So in the last, in the last few months, this is very personal. This, this has come to the fore for me. The the link between my reverence for God, and my reverence for my brothers and sisters, my neighbor. And so I was driving back into the city, and as is custom in the city of Pretoria, nearly every traffic light has someone that's that's begging. Right, and as is custom, I looked in my car uh, for something that I could give them. Right, and so I had some leftover fries in the car, so I gave them to him. But as I did this, um, it felt very weird giving the, giving this to him. Uh, I mean, in the greater scheme of things, he was he was thankful for it, but it felt very weird, and uh, I. I decided to go to a, to a store and buy him an actual full meal, right? And so, for me, as I thought about this, right, for me it was the whole thing of, you know, the whole idea of leftovers, right? Um, our theology of first fruits is very wonky, right? It's very, very wonky. I believe that more often than not, we practice the theology of leftovers, right? So we, we give to God our leftovers. We give, them, we give God our leftover, our leftover treasures. We give God our leftover time. We give God our leftover talents, right? And this, this is reflected in how we deal with those that don't have, right? This is, you know, when you, when you step out there, we give people the food that we don't have, the half-eaten food, the food that's about to go bad in our fridge. Um, we give people the clothes that we don't need, the clothes that, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'll be wearing this. It's over, it's over what I need, 
and give people the things that we don't need. And I believe there's something fundamentally wrong with that. Because this is not the God that we serve. Right? This is not the example that God has given to us. Instead, God gives and he gives abundantly. And he gives to the point of giving his son who willingly goes to the cross for us. And not only that, but even in the life to come, we are considered co-heirs of Christ, right? So God does not give us his leftovers, but God gives us his first fruits. And so for us, when our gaze isn't fixated on ourselves, and we don't spend everything that we've accumulated on ourselves first, we don't spend all our time on ourselves and we say, how much do I have left to give to God? When we are enamored by who he is and we're fixated on him as the sole creator, as the sole God, when we have that, then man, we live very different lives. Then as we go out into the world, we, we emulate that character. We mirror this God, this generous God, And people see this and they say, man, why are you so different? Why are you so different? And so our generosity isn't from our leftovers. but Our generosity should be from our first fruits. And so very recently, and uh, this isn't something that I'd say we've gotten right in in any stretch of the imagination, but very recently, you know, when when we order food, right, when we use Uber Eats or whatever, we order extra for the guy. Right? The guy comes, he delivers, say, hey, here's, here's a meal for you. How can I pray for you? Right? And often, there's, there's such a surprise in their faces because uh, for once, someone is not giving them that leftover. Someone is not saying, hey, I'll tip you 5% or whatever. Someone is going an extra mile and saying, I recognize you as someone that is doing something that is grueling, you're driving through the night, here's a meal. But even on top of that, let me give you better. Let me pray for you. All right. And so maybe we need to reflect on how we are engaging with fellow image bearers. Because this may be a reflection of whether or not we worship God as the one who sits on the throne or we've slowly taken his place on the throne. And so as we move on, um, the last verse, verse 22, reads as follows. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. And so the last verse ends on a very somber note. So this man, he responds to Jesus, but is isn't so much what he said, it's what he does. He walks away. So this this is the same man who, in the beginning, there was a sense of genuineness. He runs up to Jesus, he even kneels down. And now this man is walking away from Jesus. What he doesn't realize is that he's he's walking away from life and he's actively walking towards his death. And he walks away from Jesus and he walks towards his real treasure. And he walks towards what's really important to him. He walks towards his security. He walks towards his assurance in life. These are the things that he can't live without. In essence, he walks towards his God. And so, here's the thing. In, instead of hearing an, an invitation to immeasurable, inconceivable wealth to follow Jesus Christ, he hears a hindrance uh, to his idea of what joy is. And does that sometimes happen to us? Do we read the room wrong? Right? God speaks to us or God said someone to us uh, who loves us and say, hey, this is a hard truth. 
but I think you need to refrain from doing these things. I think you need to stop doing this. Where this, this direction that you're going in, it's not a great idea. This job that you're going for, maybe you don't need it for this season. And instead of hearing that someone is actually inviting us to, to deeper waters, to plug in more, uh, to get more of Christ, what we hear is, uh, you are taking away from my joy. What, what we hear is, uh, you are being a hindrance. And so rooted, what are the things that God is commanding? And initially, I didn't, I didn't have the word commanding. I, initially, it was what are the things that God is asking us, right? I'm changing it. What are the things that God is commanding us to walk away from, to let go of? Because here's the thing, whatever God commands, it's for, it's our, it's for our joy, He wants us to be fruitful. There is no command that God gives us uh, that moves us in a different direction that will not end with how good. So I ask the question again, rooted, what is God commanding us to let go of? What are the things that we are hoping no one approaches us on after church? Right? And here's the thing. Some of these things aren't always bad things, right? So there's the easy, there's, there's the easy things, right? Like you would say, um, yeah, God is commanding me to stop watching porn. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, is, that is an easy one, right? But, the, but there's these things that the, the roam around this, like this edge of like they're very good things, but somehow we've taken them and we've put them in the center, Right? It's the same story with, the, with, this, uh, with this young man. Wealth is not bad. Wealth in itself, it's absolutely not bad. There are numerous people in the Bible that were wealthy, and they used it well, right? And so you don't have to turn to, to the bad things. Those the Bible would deal with very easily, right, as you mature. But there's certain things that, that go around this hazy area of like, you know, this thing feels like it's becoming an idol, right? As a young church, for us, it's, you know, we still want to build our careers, you know. Is your time at the office seven times a week on emails, is it worth it? Even our families, our children can become idols. So one of the issues is that sometimes for us, the things that we need to deal with, they aren't bad things, they're good things, that we've taken and twisted them and we've put them on the throne instead of God. And so in summary, while this text feels like it's dealing primarily with material possessions, uh, there's something much more to this encounter. So the text tells us that in the end, uh, he went away grieving and so the, this rich young ruler, his inability to give away his possessions, uh, it didn't just speak of his lack of generosity. It didn't just speak to um, being an unloving neighbor. It spoke to his core issue, which is that he had another God that he valued uh, more than Yahweh. He had another God that he valued highly, more than God himself. And here's the sad thing. This is the sad thing about this story is that he approached Jesus with a lot of sincerity, with a lot of genuineness, right? The, the, he was really seeking. But in the end, no amount of sincerity or genuineness or earnestness towards God could rip that idol from his chest. Amen. It could do nothing to remove the idol from his heart. And so he walks away. Doesn't realize that his material positions actually own him. So don't, don't walk away thinking that this is primarily dealing with wealth. 
This is just dealing with our hearts, right? So you might be sitting here saying that I'm generous. I've given away half my bank account. I'm not even tithing 10%. I'm tithing way beyond. It isn't about wealth. It's about more. It's about our hearts. So in Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, For where your heart is, there your heart will be also. The rich young ruler's response revealed that his heart was in his possessions. And so family, is your heart found in Christ or is your heart found in things? And so as we land the plane, we need to answer a major, major question. This is the question that we, started, that we started with. And is what do we need to do to get eternal life? And so for that, I'll go back to scripture, right? Um, Luke 10, verse 25 to 28. And ironically, Jesus, seems like Jesus got this question quite a lot. But in this, in this particular time, this actually had a very insidious tone to it. So they were actually trying to trap Jesus. And so the text reads as follows. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked him. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, he told him. Do this, and you will live. And so in reading this, the first obvious thing that should come up is that none of us have obeyed this. None of us have loved God wholeheartedly, whether our mind, our soul, our strength, our none of us have done it. Right? Paul would say that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. None are righteous. Right? None of us have loved our neighbors as we should. And God's response is a righteous God is eternal punishment. Hell is a real place. Right? But here's, here's, and it's, this is bad news. This is bad news for everyone. But here's the good news, that our God is not an absent landlord. Yeah. He doesn't just stand by idly. Amen. And so what we see is that God makes a way. In the famous scripture but God, great news to anyone that feels the weight of not measuring up. The great news is that we don't have to measure up because but God. Yeah. And so God in his infinite goodness, he sends his son, his son Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ lives the perfect life he dies the perfect death, right? But it doesn't end there. Three days later, he's resurrected. Amen. Three days later, he's resurrected because our God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. Amen. He's a God of the living. And so this resurrected Christ says to us, yesterday, today, tomorrow, he says to us, follow me. Trust me. And we found if you're found in me, you're fine standing right with God. And you have eternal life. I love this, uh, this scripture from Romans 6 verse 4. It says, therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that Jesus as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. And this is the new life that Jesus invites us to. Right? And, this, and this is the thing that the rich young ruler missed. Right? He looked at eternal life as just a place to go, not understanding that it's not just a place, but it's also a person. Yeah. Eternal life is also just a type of life. It's a new life. Yeah. It's a different type of life. And so as the band comes up, I'm going to speak to two, two groups of people, right? So 
first group of people, you guys, you know the gospel, right? You can recite it, you can come up here, you can preach it better than me, right? But for some reason in the last while, it's become commonplace. You're not moved anymore. It's a lot of compromise in your life. This has become ordinary. A lot of us are either in that space or we're going to go into that space because that's who we are. We are forgetful people. And that's why we have a community like this where we get to remind each other and recenter each other. Oh, you are just that person that's on fire for Christ, man. Praise the Lord. So I'm going, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that God may reignite the fire that has been lost, rekindle that flame. And then I'll pray for the second group. Let's close our eyes. And so wherever you are, if you feel that you're this person, if you feel like, man, I don't feel as passionate. I don't feel, I don't feel that flame anymore. I'd say, man, just pray in your heart. Receive this prayer. And please speak to someone after the service. Don't let this moment uh, pass you by. Let's pray. Lord, um, when we look at the history of Israel, their ups and downs, Lord, we are no different. Um, we sometimes forget you, Lord. Um, we forget the most important things, Lord. We forget... Uh, where you've taken us from, Lord, and you want to go back there uh, because we believe the lies in our lives. We believe that there are better things than you, Lord. We have taken the bait. But I'm thankful, Lord, that no matter what the world gives us, Lord, one truth still remains in that you are everything that we need, everything that we'll ever need, Lord. And so I pray for those, I pray for myself where... It feels like that flame is not as bright as it used to be. I'm praying for those people who feel like, man, um, my life is filled with compromise or my life is filled with indifference. That people can't tell that I'm a Christian daily. I'm praying, Lord, that you reignite that flame. I'm praying that religious activity may not it may not dominate our lives because it's empty, but I pray that it may dominate our lives because uh, this is our worship to a living God. So Lord, we're praying that you reignite that flame that has become dim. Send us out, Lord, for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. And the second group, this is, this is a person who just stepped in here and you feel like I've never heard this before. This is all new to me. That this idea of I don't have to do it all by myself, that there's someone that has done it all. If this is the first time you're hearing this and you feel like, man, I want more. <laughs> a few words, it's, it's not my invitation. Jesus Christ invites you to more. He invites you to a full life. He invites you to a new life. And it starts today. And you don't have to worry about the next day, how you are going to make it, because Jesus Christ has done it for us today, tomorrow, and for eternity. So if that's you, please, man, don't, don't let this moment pass you by. And if you do let it pass you by, we'll be still, we'll still be preaching the same message next week. But my fear is that it, your heart might become dulled, right? You might continuously hear this message over and over again and it has no effect because your heart has just become dull. And then the other group, the other, the other people, it's people that you, you are in the church, Right, you are in the church, you are, you are serving really well, but you've gotten caught up in religious activity. You've grown up in the church, but man, you absolutely have no relationship with God. You have a relationship with His activities. So even you, Jesus is calling you, saying, follow me. And so as I pray, 
and pray where you are, but do not let this moment pass you by. Let's pray. Lord, um, this, your gospel never gets old, Lord. Um, we will be telling stories about you. We'll be, we'll be talking about this gospel. We'll be preaching it today, tomorrow, for the rest of our lives because we recognize, Lord, that uh, the event at the cross, the resurrection, Lord, are bigger than what we could ever imagine. And so my prayer, Lord, is that for anyone that has come here seeking, for anyone that has come here looking for something better where the world has dealt with them and it has not dealt with them kindly, where the world has spit them out and they're looking for a hope, Lord. I pray that they find that hope in you, that they find their meaning in you, Lord. I'm praying, Lord, that you may tug at their heart, that they may not walk away, Lord. That all that the thing that they have out there, that is security, all the wealth, Lord, it will be wiped away. But what we have in you, Lord, what we have in you is eternal and gives us a full life and so that's my prayer lord that for anyone that is seeking for anyone that has not seen you in this way lord open up their eyes open up their hearts reveal the truth of the weight of the cross and what it means lord do not let the evil one invade this space and snatch this good news from them, Lord, because this is good news. And so all of these, Lord, we test all these prayers, the, the unsaid prayers, the prayers behind the groans, Lord. We lift them up to you and we cry, Lord, hear us, Lord, hear us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.